Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Imagine for a moment that you were designing a system to encode digital data on simple magnetic tape. As the tape goes by the right head, you're in charge of turning the head off and on to represent the bits that you're trying to store. Now, as a reasonable first guess, let's say you turn the head off for zeros and then on for ones. What could be simpler? Mission accomplished, right? But not so fast. When it's time to actually read those bits back in, you'd, of course, just do the opposite. Off would mean zero and on would mean one. But on the tape, just how long is a bit? Where does one bit begin and the next bit end if you're writing a long sequence of the same bit? Let's say you wanted to write a full 512-byte sector of just zeros. So that's 4,096 zero bits in a row. Is your mechanism really precise enough to distinguish the start and end points of the 4,000th zero bit? Or how does it know where bit 4,000 ends and bit 4,001 begins? They all look alike. In the olden days of drum media, like the Bendix that you might have seen being restored on Usagi Electric, there was a clock track around the whole disc that simply cycled between 0 and 1. So your data bit transitions were just aligned with the transitions on the clock track, and it was very easy to sort out where each bit should live. When the clock track changes from 0 to 1 or 1 to 0, it means it's time to look at the data bit. But that requires a dedicated track and a dedicated head to read it, which is fine on a drum where you have to have one head per track anyway. But since there's only one head per surface on a traditional floppy or hard disk, it's not a workable solution for those types of drives. But these problems predate hard drives and applied to tape as well. Just as the rotational speed of a hard drive might vary enough to throw off the timing of where the bits live, a tape can vary as well and even stretch too. It would be trivial to write a clock track alongside the data track, and I'm sure that was no doubt done by somebody at some point, but it's not really efficient because you waste an entire track of the tape on the clock when it could be carrying data if only you could solve the original problem of repeated runs of ones and zeros being hard to decode. Fortunately, this problem is almost as old as computers themselves and has been solved many times over. Today we're going to track the evolution of the formats used initially in tapes and then in hard and floppy disks from NZRI to PE to GCR to MFM and RLL. Pretty soon that alphabet soup of weird acronyms that you've probably heard of before but never really understood will make perfect sense. Now, the critical issue for tapes was ensuring that the unit could accurately distinguish between data bits while reading long streams of the tape's magnetic flux, often at high speeds. To handle this, several modulation schemes were explicitly developed for magnetic tape. Among the most prominent were NRZI, which is non-return to zero inverted. Also common was PE, which is phase encoding, and later GCR, which is group coded recording. Let's take a closer look at how these encoding formats worked and why they were chosen. One of the most widely used formats for magnetic tape was non-return to zero inverted, or NRZI. NRZI was relatively straightforward and widely adopted in the early days of tape because it was simple to implement. With NRZI, data is written not as directly as ones and zeros, but as changes in the magnetic flux. So specifically, a 1 is represented by a change in the magnetic state, while a 0 is represented by no change. This means that 1s result in transitions on the tape, like flipping the polarity of the magnetic field, while zeros leave the magnetic field unchanged. The brilliance of NRZI lay in its simplicity. It ensured that the tape head could easily detect 1s because every time it encountered a flux change, it knew it was reading a 1. This reduced the ambiguity in detecting long streams of identical bits, which otherwise might have led to synchronization issues. In other words, transitions acted as natural timing marks for the readhead, making it easier to decode data. However, while NRZI helped with synchronization, it didn't entirely solve the problem of long runs of zeros. If there were too many consecutive zeros, which would result in no flux changes for a long period, the tape reader might lose track of where it was in the data stream, leading to errors. So more sophisticated encoding schemes would soon address this issue. As the need for better reliability grew, magnetic tape systems began to adopt phase encoding, also known as Manchester encoding. In this format, timing was built into the signal itself. With phase encoding, every bit, whether it's a 1 or a 0, was represented by a transition. A 0 was encoded as a transition from high to low, and a 1 was encoded as a transition from low to high. This meant that there were always transitions, regardless of the data being written. PE ensured that the read had never encountered a situation with no transitions for an extended period, so it was great. Since every single bit caused a transition, the clock signal was perfectly embedded in the data itself. This made it impossible for the tape head to lose synchronization, which was a significant advantage in early systems where precise timing was otherwise difficult to achieve. It also improved and simplified the read circuitry because the transitions between states acted as both data markers and timing signals. 
but the trade-off with PE is that it required twice as many transitions as NRZI for the same amount of data. And while this improved reliability, it also effectively halved the data density. You might as well have a manual clock track at that point, but despite this, the clear benefits of embedded clocking made PE a popular choice, particularly in systems where data integrity was more important than maximizing capacity. In the 70s and 80s, group-coded recording, or GCR, the same encoding method used in some disk systems, was adopted for magnetic tape to address the trade-offs of NRZI and PE. GCR sought to increase the data density on tape while maintaining reliable synchronization. In GCR, groups of bits, usually four bits at a time, are mapped to longer patterns, usually five bits, that are specifically chosen to avoid long runs of zeros. By carefully selecting which patterns are allowed, GCR ensures that there are always enough transitions to keep the read head synchronized without needing as many transitions as phase encoding. In essence, here's how it works. You write down the 16 4-bit patterns that you might actually need to transmit. Now you pair them with any of the 32 5-bit patterns you like, as long as those patterns don't contain runs of 3 bits in a row. You throw away those and you just don't use them. When you want to send the original 4-bit pattern of 0000, which could be a problem, you look it up and you would send pattern 11001 instead. These are kind of arbitrary choices. They could be mapped to almost anything, as long as they're mapped to a bit pattern that the receiver also knows how to decode. The receiver knows to decode that back to 0000, and so you avoided sending four zeros in a row. When I first finally understood GCR, which sometimes feels like 20 minutes ago, it was looking at the bit table that helped me understand it all. All they're really doing is mapping a smaller set of number of bits to a larger number of bits and making sure never to use the inconvenient patterns that contain long bit runs. You lose some data density because you're adding an extra bit, but you eliminate the need for a clock track or forced transitions. GCR offered the best of both worlds. Improved data density compared to phase encoding because not every bit requires a transition, and better synchronization and reliability than NRZI. The 5-bit patterns used to encode the 4 bits of data ensured that there were enough transitions to keep the read head synchronized, but the overhead wasn't as high as in phase encoding where every bit required a transition. GCR was a particularly common choice for the later 9-track tapes in mainframes and minicomputers. But for even higher capacity tape systems, run-length limited encoding, which we will discuss more in the context of hard drives, also found its way into the tape world. The encoding known as 2,7 RLL was used in high-end systems to push the limits of how much data could be stored per inch of tape. In brief, RLL worked by limiting the number of consecutive zeros allowed between ones. This ensured that the tape drive head could remain synchronized with the data while still achieving pretty high data density. RLL encoding on tape allowed engineers to pack more data per inch of tape while maintaining enough flux transitions to keep the system accurate. Magnetic tape is typically written in long streams, exacerbating the synchronization problems. Losing track of the data stream could be disastrous because it might mean having to back up and reread large sections of tape to recover from errors. Tape systems were also prone to errors caused by dust, physical wear, or the tape stretching. These modulation schemes added redundancy and timing information to help correct such issues. Each encoding format for magnetic tape was an attempt to solve these problems by introducing more transitions, adding more timing information, or improving the data density. NRZI was simple but prone to synchronization problems. Phase encoding solved the synchronization issue, but it was inefficient. GCR struck a balance between density and synchronization, and then RLL pushed the limits of how much data you could cram into a length of tape. Eventually, tape storage systems adopted digital error correction methods like Reed-Solomon error correction, which became more common as computing power grew. This allowed for even more reliable tape systems because digital techniques could automatically handle many types of errors, reducing the need for complex modulation schemes to handle the synchronization by itself. Let's go back, or in this case, I guess, forward, to the days of the Apple II and the C64 for a moment. That's where we again find GCR, Group Coded Recording, a format that was a mainstay in early systems like the Apple and Commodore computers. But why did the early computer systems need something like GCR in the first place? With a sector hole in the floppy, it has synchronization, so it never has to write more than a track at once. But disk drives at the time were, let's say, a bit primitive still. The electronics were noisy and the data streams were prone to corruption. So GCR was designed with resilience in mind. By encoding data in group chunks, it ensured that even if part of the signal got a little garbled, the drive could still probably make a decent guess of what the data was supposed to be. The key advantage of GCR was its resilience. It traded a bit of space efficiency for reliability, ensuring that the floppy disks of the day didn't just become frustratingly error-prone storage devices. 
Without GCR's air tolerant design, early computing on systems like the Apple II might have been a lot more painful. As hard drives and floppy drives improved in the late 70s and 80s, engineers looked for ways to increase data density without sacrificing reliability. Now, the very first floppies, like on IBM mainframes, were encoded with an ancient scheme known as frequency modulation, or FM. With FM, a zero in the original data is encoded by a single magnetic flux transition during the period, and ones are encoded as two transitions. But it wasn't as ideal for hard drives. Enter Modified Frequency Modulation, or MFM, which became the de facto standard for most PCs, including the IBM PC and all the clones. MFM was a huge leap forward in efficiency compared to FM and GCR. In essence, MFM was a modulation scheme that encoded data in a way that reduced the number of transitions, or flux reversals, needed to represent bits on the disk. Here's how it worked. With MFM, a 1 is represented by a flux transition, but only if it follows a 0. If a 1 follows another 1, then there's no transition between them. Meanwhile, 0 is only represented by a transition if it follows another 0. These rules might sound convoluted, but what it does is reduce the number of transitions needed to encode a stream of data compared to the earlier methods like FM. Fewer transitions mean you can pack more data onto the disk. To understand why this was such a big deal, we need to consider the fundamental challenge of writing data to magnetic media. The faster you can switch to magnetic states, the more data you can store on the media. But there's a catch. Too many transitions too close together and the drive's read head begins to struggle with timing, leading to errors. MFM cleverly balanced these concerns. By reducing unnecessary transition, it allowed more bits to be crammed into the same physical space, while still ensuring that the read head could reliably pick out those transitions without getting confused. At its core, MFM packs two digital bits into each clock cycle, compared to FM's one bit per clock cycle. This means MFM essentially doubles the data density compared to frequency modulation. However, it was still designed with reliability in mind. The use of transitions to signal data ensured that even if the drive's timing drifted slightly, it could still recover the correct data by looking at the patterns of the transitions. MFM was a real workhorse because it struck an optimal balance between speed, efficiency, and reliability for the hardware of its time. It was used not only in the 5.25 inch and 3.5 inch floppy disks, but also in the first generations of hard drives. It became the industry standard for IBM PCs, meaning it shaped the computing landscape of the 1980s and beyond. By the late 1980s, hardware had improved further and manufacturers wanted to push the limits of what their drives could store without requiring significant new technological developments. Enter RunLink Limited, or RLL, which took the concepts behind MFM and turned them up to 11. Where MFM encoded 2 bits per clock cycle, RLL could encode up to 3 bits per clock cycle, squeezing 50% more data onto the same disk. But this wasn't just a brute force RAM in more data scheme. RLL involved a much more sophisticated encoding mechanism that carefully controlled the spacing of the flux transitions to achieve this efficiency. The run length limited part of RLL refers to a rule about how many consecutive identical bits are allowed in the encoded data. The format imposes some limits. Specifically, it ensures that there's never too long a run of zeros or ones, which helps keep the readhead synchronized with the data stream. Essentially, the encoding is designed so that even in the worst case, the drive's electronics can still reliably track where the bits are or where they were supposed to be. RLL uses a more complex encoding system where multiple bits of data are mapped to larger groups of magnetic transitions. For example, in the RLL 2,7 scheme, a common variation, each two bits of data are encoded as either a 3 or a 4-bit pattern. This encoding ensures there are always enough transitions to keep the readhead in sync while still allowing more data bits to be packed into the same space compared to MFM. Now, I might be misremembering it, but I have memories of back in the 90s taking a drive that was an MFM drive and just swapping it in an RLL controller and it magically worked and increased the storage density and I got more space. I think that was actually possible. Let me know in the video comments if you remember doing that as well. But why go to all this trouble? Simple, storage space. In the late 80s and early 90s, hard drives were expensive and small by today's standards. RLL gave drive manufacturers a way to market larger capacity drives without needing to completely redesign or invent new hardware. With the right electronics, an RLL encoded drive could hold up to 50% more data than its MFM counterpart, which was a massive selling point at the time. However, RLL encoding also came with its own risks as it placed greater demands on the precision of the drive's read-write mechanism. A slightly misaligned read head or a degraded magnetic surface could lead to more errors. Still, for many users and manufacturers, the trade-off was worth it. Extra storage space without needing to invest in a brand new drive. The evolution from GCR to MFM to RLL wasn't just about pushing the limits of what was possible. It was about finding the right balance for the hardware of the time. 
So GCR prioritized reliability in the face of noisy air-prone drives, while MFM optimized for density without pushing the hardware too far. RLL, the most aggressive of the three, was all about squeezing every last byte out of the technology as it matured. Each format represents a snapshot of where data storage technology was at a particular point in time, and how engineers were constantly balancing the trade-offs between speed, capacity, and reliability. These encoding methods are a testament to how creative thinking can push technology beyond what seems possible, even with the limitations of the day. Now, I realize that worrying about how bits are stored on a magnetic media might seem a little quaint in the age of flash storage, but I've still got a closet of spinning rust all of my own, and I thought the topic was kind of a cool one. If you agree and enjoyed it, despite being all about magnetic flux, please be sure to leave a like on the video and consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't done so already. And if you have, thank you. Be sure to turn on the notification bell. If you have any interest in matters related to the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.